Cool. Glass of water. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. Uh, it's really great to have you with us here tonight. Um, and um, we're really looking forward to speaking with our guest tonight, David Stowe. Um, and he's going to be talking to us about Australian bird photography. I guess we did a, uh, a, a survey um, not that long ago. And in that survey, it indicated that um, a lot of um, people joining in would like to see um, every now and then a, an episode that slightly diverts from uh, landscape photography. And so um, we thought, well, bird photography is something that a lot of landscape photographers actually end up doing while they're out in the landscape and, and probably have a very natural kind of view on the world and um, birding, bird photography obviously sits very well in that place. And I know myself, I'm very interested in bird photography and, and have been interested in bird watching since I was very young. So I'm, I'm quite excited about tonight's show. Um, Paulie, how's um, your week been? Well, it's been beautiful and sunny and now we've finally got the, uh, the rock and roll cats and dogs sort of knocking on the roof right now. And 100 mil plus, maybe 175 have a night on the mountains. So there's a few places that there's this place called Disappearing Tarn that just kind of literally maybe is visible a couple of days every few years. And it involves very, very serious, heavy local rain. And it used to be a bit of a secret. And last year, I think there was 1,500 people a day going out there. But it's this gorgeous little town out the back of Mount Wellington that is crystal clear. Like the visibility in this pool is unbelievable. And it just disappears in hours. It's a bit of this elusive mystery sort of place. Um, yeah, what I've been doing, I um, just got back from a big stint on Bruni Island doing a lot of uh, landscape and drone and, and astro work because it was just like every single night, every single day was, was absolutely crystal clear. And the one thing I missed was the most epic... <laughs> uh aurora we've had in years uh which of course lukey was all over uh i just raced back from the island and had to do a few things and i went out and everyone said it's going to be up all night it's going to be good i got there pulled out the camera and as i was pulling out the camera this massive sheet of clouds came over and just took over the aurora and i was like you've got to be joking and i was ringing up the boys like oh it's pumping down here oh it's so good and i'm just like oh and i was um it was gutting. definitely um definitely a night to remember in terms of aurora chasing so um i'll remember it all for and then luke and i are, are planning on um, the, we're having another meeting i finally do this. get to editing the pictures I'll, I'll dedicate one to you how about that yeah thanks <laughs> what was that so we're <laughs> luke and i are also looking at being part of an incredible art project called art for takana and it's changed its name from takana motion so i've been a part of all of them since its inception about seven eight years ago it's one of the largest um environmental art projects in, in the country and uh we've got between 100 and 150 artists come out into the remote taikon wilderness on the northwest coast and we set up six seven or eight different remote sort of base camps because it's a pretty remote wild place and not everyone and not all artists are going to be comfortable in terms of managing themselves in a, in a wild remote place so so we set up base camps and guides for certain people and, and luke and i are trying to get into into a particularly remote part of the of the coastline that uh, I've actually never made it to in, in 20 years of heading out there. So, so a little bit excited about that. That's sort of over the Easter weekend, quite amazing to collaborate and see how other artists from different genres interact with place. You know, we, we interact with it photographically, but how does a dancer interact with it or a singer or a poet or a painter uh, or a writer? And I get to meet all these people and, and I've actually made it over the years. One of my projects has been to document the artists interacting with place. And that's been really fascinating for me to look over the shoulder of the way other people see a landscape and interact with the landscape. Cause they're also often working with light or, or sound or, or feeling. And, and I feel like all those things have influenced me and broadened my capacity and, and uh, approach to how I, how I then end up applying my photography. So pretty excited about that. And uh, yeah, how about you Lucky? Yeah, no, certainly um, I've been um, in your shadow for, uh, across those things in terms of the Bruni shooting and also um, working on that um, Art for Takana project as well, which is um, it's always good to be able to use your skills in photography um, to put it towards a very meaningful cause and, and, and helping people become aware of um, areas that are under threat and areas that, that need to be protected um, appropriately. So very much um, into that. Uh, and, and um, yeah. And yeah, birds are you know, that's a very g generic term, but there's so many species of birds. In fact, one of the main, the organization we're looking at doing this project under actually has a huge campaign for 
um, conserving the swift swift parrots. Yep, as swift well parrot, there you go. So that's been a kind of a crossover, and 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 that's been something I've been around and a part of. And even on Bruni, we literally heard some two weeks ago just running around the trees just above us, and we couldn't quite spot them. We probably needed David there uh, to pull them pull them out of the woodwork, so to speak. But uh, it was it was amazing to have something so real and tangible, and it got me thinking. Geez, how how would I capture these if I really could? So, so David's going to get put on the spot tonight. But <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There. So I've known David for quite a few years, and and I've known some of his uh, friends and colleagues and employees even longer, uh, and they all speak super highly of him. He's an absolute gentleman in uh, in the Australian photographic community, and very highly regarded not only in his wildlife and, and bird photography, but in a much wider sense. He's a great businessman and he runs an incredibly successful uh, wedding business as well in, in, in Sydney that a bunch of my friends have been working for for years and, and they all just love working for him and uh, they're great judges of character. So that, that said a lot to me before I even met David and it was even more of a delight when I did. And, um, you know, if I had his T-shirt collection, I'd be much happier. <laughs> So, uh, so I think I said in the brief, like uh, Lucky would describe the award better, but David won the is it the 2015 Anzang Awards mm. yep. with this, yeah. with specifically with with a, quite an abstract shot of of bird photography, and we 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 were going to use that for the cover shot, but we we love the other one that the designer we were taking and pulling between that one and uh, and the one we ended up choosing, but uh, we'll probably come across that image at some stage tonight, but um. That is a it is a very esteemed award, and and it's very very hard to get to the top of the top in terms of it's very hard to even make it in, as I found it out again yes yeah. again this <laughs> yeah, year. So. I never made it in. <laughs> but uh, next next a bit bums the first time in four years he hasn't made it in. So I'm uh, well, he can't be that bummed because I don't know many people that make it in every year. So hats off to you, Nick. We're, we're all we'll, we'll, the three of us will take a drink together on that one. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, David, how how, do you, how would you describe your your wider kind of relationship with image taking? Because obviously you're involved. You've got a few different hats that that you wear. Yeah, gee, that's a big question to start off with, mate. Right <laughs> in the deep um, Yeah, one of the things I've really enjoyed about photography, I think, has been that journey of, um, yeah, not just sticking with one genre. Like obviously weddings and portraits have been my bread and butter for, you know, 25 years or whatever, but it's been really nice, especially in later years to sort of be diverging into different things. And uh, especially obviously to be able to make a bit of an income from wildlife and bird photography and tours and workshops and that sort of stuff. So yeah, it's, I've always loved photography, always loved having a camera in my hand and I can't, go anywhere without looking with a photographer's eyes you know like we'll be driving on the bush and like we might see or some country town see some really cool wall or something and you know if i'm traveling with a birding mate they'll always say oh, i bet you want a bride and groom in front of that wall or something like that and, you know he already knows what i'm looking at sort of thing which is uh which is kind of fun but um yeah no, it's, it's very um it's kind of ironic almost being asked to talk about uh, bird photography on a landscape photography you know show because landscape photography and bird photography are just so completely opposite in uh, you know just approach and discipline and technique and equipment of you know you bird photography you want a really long lens landscape photography you want a really wide lens landscape photography you want to be rock solid on your tripod bird photography you want to be you know swinging a gimbal around um, you know, you want a high ISO for bird photography, whereas you want low ISO for, for landscapes. And so sometimes uh, when you're sort of teaching people that have come from a, a more landscape sort of background, it's it's actually quite hard to sort of... Um, break them all. Yeah, and... break those habits and, and get them to switch over sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah. So everybody stand up and shake shake themselves around, come back upside down and, and we'll get on with the show. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I don't see learn. them as that. I, I, t I totally understand the, the technical approach, but to me, um, all the natural creatures of the world are, are an integral part of the landscape being what it is. You know, those birds spread the seeds of the very plants that we're photographing. You know, it's, it, they're so interconnected that, and they surround us wherever I go. There's probably almost no way that we shoot. We don't hear them or see them, or they're not, you know, involved somehow in the landscape that we're in regardless. So, 
Yeah. So to me, it's like more like a subgenre, and and it, it is a specialist skill, I think, to to do it well. And I remember running a, I was running an aerial workshop in Kakadu year before last with a client, and and it just happened to be birding week in Kakadu, and I was <laughs> like, how's your luck? <laughs> and I went out on a private tour with uh, uh, Luke. What's his name? Is it Luke Thompson? Luke, Luke uh, Patterson. Yeah, Luke Patterson and and his son, and they were like, uh, they were like uh, mirrors of each other. So his, his son had like the same clothes and the same kind of camera, but it was slightly smaller. And he was like the mini me of dad. And, and, you know, I was looked at the gimbals and all the lighting and the huge lenses. And, and I was out there with my 7200 with a two times converter on trying to get something. And in the end, I just put it away and just watched him. Yeah. Uh, it was actually felt like I'd, I would learn more from uh, watching a master at work that I would just clambering around on my own. And uh, I think what I, what I want to, people to leave with the show is an inspiration about how to approach it if they choose to. And I think for some people when they get seriously in it, they think they can't do anything unless they've got, you know, one of those that you've got behind you uh, for ten or $15,000 to get a decent photograph. And, and so I, I sort of like to just uh, engage people in a way that's a bit more um, exciting and, and inclusive, I guess, about how to, at the very least, just, you know, be open-minded about if they if you choose to follow that path you know what do you look for you know how do you research the sounds you know what are the seasons and the times of year or because there's a lot of knowledge behind it i think in terms of understanding where they're going to be when and that's that's one of the beautiful parts of the art of it i think just like landscape photographers it's the season and it's the color and and it's you know the temperature has an effect and the water flow and the rain it's the same with the birds, you know, they follow their own patterns and, and their own seasons and, and their own breeding cycles and interactivity with other parts of the landscape. And I think being more aware of that, I guess, opens everyone to the possibility of, of that dynamism and interactivity and interconnectedness of the wider landscape as a whole, uh, which I think is just a beautiful space to be present with, regardless of what you're trying to shoot in the landscape. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's um, actually yeah, talking about the, the gear, for a second yeah you're right it's um uh, the big lenses are always such a magnet for conversation and sometimes frustratingly so like everyone you know you see with big lens and everyone walking past goes oh that's a serious camera you know or how far can you see with that and all that sort of stuff and so um i think the first thing with like any genre is use the camera you've got you know, like you say, if you've only got your 70 to 200, don't be put off by someone with a big lens. Just use it and maybe take a different style of shot. You know, you, you may not get that real tight portrait, but you're going to get something beautiful and, and a bit more landscape, birdscape sort of shot, you know. And, um, yeah, just learning to use whatever you've got, I think, is obviously the most important thing. Uh, and also, all, sorry, David, I, I also think of a lot of um, landscape photos that more recently have done well in competitions or such, and generally there's a bird in them or, or that's a, a point yeah. of interest. Um, it might not be an actual portrait, but um, it's amazing how just some well-placed birds in a scene can can kind of lift an image as well. So I think um, that's an element to photos that a lot of landscape photographers actually do look for. Even think of Matt Palmer's um, yeah. cockatoo in the, in the tree in, in his um, portfolio that, that got him the... Um, photographer of the year and that sort of thing so um yeah, yeah definitely hey, Shane, we might element. just have maddie on the show next week yeah that's right yeah yeah he, he's got some awesome work and yeah I, I loved that series as well for that same reason i think it goes back paul to what you were saying before about that that link between the landscape and what's in it you know you've got the the wide view but then when you you know drill down and get that fine view there is so much in there and yeah it's absolutely all connected and yeah i think it's really nice to have that the dynamic nature of something moving within the landscape and you know showing where it lives and uh yeah i, I think that's really cool yeah awesome well i also and know I a bunch of in fact uh when we had the americans on the show look um tara and jared jared's main la landscape lens is a 100 to 400 that he uses almost exclusively so so there's some photographers that prefer a, a telephoto point of view to isolate subjects and simplify their compositions and reach deeper into, into pockets of landscapes, you know, rather than just the broad. So, so uh, I, I certainly move around myself. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of fun with my 7200 in a landscape environment. Yeah, and um, Nick, have to carry Nick's it long particularly distance. taken some really excellent bird shots as well. Um, I know that he's quite 
uh, keen to pick off a, a good shot or two if um, there's ever a moment. So, yeah, it's definitely um, something that we're all interested in in some way. Um, so in terms of um, equipment, um, what what's your sort of go-to setup, David? Uh, the go-to these days is the Canon R5 and the uh, 500. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was that? Sorry, the, the lens? <laughs> and the 500 F4. Okay. Yep. It's the... Uh... I'll drop everything in the background there. So you can see it's not very big. <laughs> Fits in your back pocket. <laughs> Put it in your carry-on on the plane. Yeah, well, I, I generally do um I generally do try and fit it into, you know, my backpack in the carry-on luggage. Oh my god, plane. you actually do. I was joking. No, 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 no. Wow. You know what? I, I the one time I put it in in my check-in bag, uh, it came with a dent on the front element. Just on Ooh. a metal ring around it. It's like, yeah, no, I won't be doing that again. Jeez. So it's um, yeah, it's it is a lot of lens and a lot of money, and uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a my baby when you go on a plane, you know, you put it in the backpack on whatever else. It doesn't matter if you can't fit everything else in, but that um, that definitely takes pride of place. These clothes and underwear got the lens, baby. Well, you can check them into the you know into the yeah. <laughs> check-in bag, so that's all good. Yeah. <laughs> The, um, so would you say um, if you're out on a shoot, that would be like, you know, 90% plus on the camera or 100% on the camera or is there times where you might go for something a little shorter? Uh, yeah, probably, you know, 80 plus percent would be the 500 and probably, you know, 90% of that would have the 1.4 converted on it as well. Okay. Um, so I'm usually shooting at, you know, 700 mil. Um, which is you know 700 at f5.6, which is is great. Uh, a lot of guys I know use a 600 f4. For me, you know, I'm not a big guy. I've always found the extra size and bulk of the 600 just a bit more prohibitive. Um, and you know, as cameras have got better, the, the croppability is is there anyway in, in decent bodies and shooting well and, and in good light and exposing well and that sort of thing. So. Um, yeah, I've never had any problem not having the extra reach of the 600. But, yes, I do typically shoot with a 1.4 on, you know, almost all the time. Mm-hmm. And So so, so if we go back a step, David, like yeah. you wouldn't have started with that. What was your kind of evolution in terms of yeah, reaching okay. into the world of, world of bird yeah, photography through your equipment? So the evolution, I mean, going back to the film days, um, that was hard, you know, when I first started getting into bird photography, uh, you know, with a, an EOS 5 and, a, you know, a 300 F4. I, I, my parents got me a 300 F4 secondhand um, and I think it was, oh, I can't remember how much it was, but it was, you know, it wasn't, wasn't cheap. But even that with a converter on was fairly slow. It was only sort of 420 mil and shooting slide film, it was just so... Uh, unforgiving so unforgiving and hit and miss and you know I, I look back now and cringe and, and things even the start of digital you know was still pretty woeful in terms of the quality I was I was achieving um, and a lot of that was also with the ISO you know because when you're shooting say 400 ISO you just can't get the shutter speed fast enough to be wielding around a long lens you know whereas these days it's amazing being able to shoot you know with 1600 ISO as a default sort of thing, which is, you know, really what you need to do. So, yeah, so the early days was a 300 F4 Canon, uh, which was a nice and lightweight. And um, it was probably oh, sort of mid-2000s, I think, when I, or early 2000s, when joined Canon CPS, the Canon Professional Services, and, you know, had the opportunity to, well, meet some really cool guys there, but to also borrow you know, a five or 600 mil lens. And I remember we did a Cape York trip in 2004, I think, and I borrowed a 600 mil F4 from Canon for four weeks, which was insane because back then love. it was 18 grand back then, you know, and there's like, there's no way I'm never, just never, ever going to be able to afford justify one of these lenses, you know, it's just, but it was amazing. And, and unfortunately, you know, once you've tried it, you know, it's like you try a new camera or a new lens that does the job and you go, bugger, you know. Uh, I so, yeah, the end, yeah. yeah, so in 2008, I think it was, yeah, I had a good good year and business and, yeah, <laughs> bugger it. I'm gonna, Merry Christmas. I'm going to buy one and it was, um, 
Oh, I think they dropped a lot in the 500 back then. It was only about eight or nine grand or something like that, which comparatively was a bargain, you know. Um, and they've since gone up again lately. But, um, yeah, that was – and once I had that, the Mark One 500 F4, that was just, you know, game-changing. It was just such a – it's such a beautiful lens, you know, the – the quality of the out of focus areas, the the soft, creamy backgrounds, and just the absolute sharpness of the lens is just it's intoxicating. And and once you have gone to something like that, unfortunately you can't go back. Um, so it kind of ruins you. <laughs> so if um uh, something God forbid happened to it, you'd just be right on to the same thing again, do you think? Yeah, well, this is oh, yeah. my second one. So this is the Mark yep. II 500. I sold the Mark One a few years ago now, just you know, Mark One was getting older and, you know, I was starting to worry about if it, spare parts being available and that sort of thing. And, um, again, managed to sell it to a, to a mate, a bird photography sort of bird watching guide out in Alice Springs. And, um, yeah, so bought the new one and, yeah, it still served me well. So I think the next mm. iteration might be waiting to see what they do with the uh, RF mount. Oh, of course. Does this, does this yeah. have um, any image stabilisation in it? Yeah, yep. Yeah, they've, they've all had image stabilisation, which is unreal, you know. Um, in fact, the well, the 100 or 400, which is my other sort of go-to lens, if I'm not wanting the big lens, then I'll take the 100 or 400. And uh, the Mark, Mark 1 or 2? Mark 2, yeah. Yeah, that's a nice lens. It really yeah, is. Nice it's really sharp. You can get great results even with a 1.4 converter on it. Um, it's, you know, I've, I've handheld shots on that at, you know, a 30th, 50th of a second um, wow. and they've been sharp. You know, the image stabiliser is that good. I mean, obviously, you know, you're not going to get every shot sharp shooting like that, but, yeah, it's it's really good. And that's the advancements in image stabilisation with the body now on the R5 and things, and I'm sure the next iteration of lenses will be – it's 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 getting easier and easier, you know, it really is. How do you how do you find the, the tracking on the R5? Have you been pushing that one, the animal oh, tracking? I yeah, it is absolutely a game changer. It's making uh, bird photography is really quite difficult and birds in flight are really difficult, whereas the new mirrorless bodies now with the eye detect autofocus are just making it, you know, pretty foolproof almost. You know, it's, it's um, you know, no disrespect to anyone, but, it, but anyone can do it almost now uh, and get a, a sharp shot. And the, the keeper rate from the old days, so to speak, is, is just chalk and cheese I mean, even coming from a 1dx mark ii uh to this is you know just a massive leap and um i we've heard a lot about canon and obviously not all of us shoot canon in in your workshops and that kind of thing do you have um do you notice um or, or i guess wide more widely in, in with your peers like uh, any particular lenses say for nikon and sony and maybe those sort of systems that, that seem to be a go-to yeah, yeah. Look, certainly uh, the Nikon 500PF is an insane lens, you know, again, for that that size and weight um, and sharpness for, for this, what you get for that is, is fantastic. You know, um, Henry Cook, who I do workshops with, he's been um, lusting after a, a 500PF. He's got a Nikon D810 and, um, and a 500 F4 Nikon, Nikon lens. But yeah, that 500PF is fantastic. The 300F4PF is great. Um, the Sony, you know, 200 to 600, that's great. Even the 100 to 500, you know, Nikon is, is good. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots, of, lots of good things out there. I mean, we have, on our workshops, we'll have people that, you know, we had a Lord Howe trip a couple of years ago where two ladies had point and shoot, you know, Nikon super zoom sort of things. And, um, you know, yeah, that, that's, that's the thing. It's whatever people have, it's great to learn how to use better and teach them how to use it better. And then once you, once you can see what you're missing and understand the limitations of the camera yourself, then it's a good time to go, okay, well, what can I move to next? Mm. But if, if you're still trying to work out the difference between an aperture and a shutter speed and things, then yeah, there's no point saying, oh yeah, go and buy an R5 and a 600 mil lens, you know, and just fork out 20 grand and <laughs> you'll be a great photographer. So, really I guess across, the, across yeah. the range, is it, there's a bunch of sort of 100 to 400, 100 to 500 kind of 
200 to 500 ranges and, yeah. and tamrons and yeah and the sigmas. Uh, sigmas and and that kind of thing like just to in terms of this accessibility for maybe if people get excited after the show to, to maybe get more serious about it as in a good step and so yeah i mean luke made a good point because uh, a lot of the a lot of viewers use all sorts of different systems but um just quickly going back to canon partly because they've just as an example produced a whole bunch of quite long lenses for really quite low prices uh that could be another option for people to really getting into but they're un they're unusual aren't they david like f11 lenses yeah yeah it's um I remember when they first started leaking the specs of things and when they first released them and everyone's going, oh, F11, what are you doing? You know, you need wider aperture and blah, blah, blah. And everyone was really bagging them out. But it, it made total sense to me because on one hand, you've already got, you know, the pinnacle like sharp as F4 expensive big heavy lenses. You, you know, for people that want the ultimate quality and can afford it, they've already got it covered. So what they were missing is an affordable lens, as you say, like to get people into bird photography a lot of a lot of our, our clients for example on workshops they they don't want to lift a three kilogram lens and a one kilogram body you know like there's just a physical possibility regardless of the cost and quality they just don't want to be just don't want it you know and so having something that is affordable lightweight and you know pretty sharp is i think it's a brilliant marketing move from canon you know like good on them and hey, what were the ranges again just so people know there's a 600 mil f11 and an 800 mil f11, and they're, you know, less than two grand each, you know, 1500 or something like that. Um, and um, I don't know if you've actually used them, but it, you know, is f11 actually kind of um, still, you know, obviously be pushing some serious ISO to get some of the subjects sharp? Is that still? I guess nowadays with cameras, the higher ISOs are getting cleaner and cleaner too, and I guess that's maybe an acknowledgement of why they can get away with a lens like that, perhaps. Absolutely. Yeah. Look, the R5 and R6, for example, and, you know, the Sony and Nikon equivalents, you know, the, the A9s and, and, and Z7. Z7. Yeah. yeah, they're all uh, ISO, again, going back to the film thing, from when, you know, 400 ISO was, was really fast. My 1DX, I would shoot, you know, 1600 as a, as a default ISO, and you can absolutely shoot 32, 6,400 on the R5, no problem at all if you expose well. And so, and with the image stabilisation, et cetera, as well, it just makes it so usable. So I, I just, yeah, I, I think that's definitely playing into their mentality, you know, the fact that, okay, well, ISO is going to get better. And you've also got, you know, as, as you know, like Topaz, Denoise and things like that, mm. you know, software that is now, miraculous again it is miraculous yeah. it's really incredible so yeah I, I haven't actually shot with them myself uh mate of mine Jan Wegener he's uh got a YouTube channel uh who he's done some reviews on them so if anyone wants to check out his stuff um he, he's got some good reviews on so, them. and he's got essentially I guess beautiful photos I'm, I'm, I've been following him for a while and um yeah, yeah. Some pretty gobsmacking work there yeah absolutely yeah but I get from that you know, last five minute conversation, it's actually a really amazing time to get into uh, this kind of photography in terms of that all of a sudden you've got uh, equipment that's so capable compared to the past that can sort of accelerate you forward and a lot quicker than, than the old film days. Being a film photographer myself yep. and trying to shoot wildlife and different things, I've got a few clues and uh, shooting, shooting slide film way back in the day. <laughs> Just the latitudes, you know, like a stop to it the most. If you get it wrong, you just toast. And so you're a little bit spoiled. So you don't necessarily need to go that high end. But at the same time, there's so much great technology coming out in stabilization. So many cameras that now have in body stabilization that didn't used to have. Um, there's a lot of cameras that are moving into tracking based sort of systems as well that can help really support the process. And, and like we just said, there's there's a lot of the camera uh, companies have, uh, have options or even third-party lenses that are a great stepping stone into getting into that field. So it's a pretty much, it's, it's a really good time from an equipment point of view to, to be moving into this realm, I think, is the gist of what I got from that conversation, actually. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Totally agree. And, and it's, I think in, so from a, a, a bird watching perspective, you know, like in years gone by, uh, there'll be a lot of bird watches, 
and then as cameras have, have become, is that, more are they, aren't they called Twitch? Is it Twitches? Yeah, yeah, Twitch as well as there's different <laughs> level. You know, there's there's bird watches and then there's Twitches, right? And then, all right, do you want to explain it to us? Yeah, this, is, this okay. is part of the culture of the whole thing, by the way, everyone. Yeah, well, so if you get right into it, so especially again when when photography wasn't as mainstream in the bird watching world as it is now, you have normal bird watchers who are happy; they want to go and see, you know, they want to see nice birds and happy to go and you know travel around a little bit. And then you've got twitchers who will fly from one end of the country to another to see a rare bird that's turned up, you know, it might be the first time this species has been recorded in Australia, sort of, for example. So, you know, the, the, the twitchers will be like twitching, jumping, ready to go for that new one because they want to, it's a bit of that con, uh, obsessive compulsive ticking, you know, people tick off on their list and they, you know, say how many birds they've seen and, you know, uh, you want to see as many birds as you can either in Australia or the world, or if you get right into it, people will have state lists. Uh, they'll have county lists or backyard yeah, lists. Right. Um, and it can be, yeah, quite, yeah. I want to see a good idea of it. Um, watch the movie The Big Year with Jack Black in it. And yeah. Um, I love that. That's such a funny film, but um, it really does show the, the passion that these people have. Um, Absolutely. For that kind of thing, so. Um, it was actually a really well done movie, to be honest, uh, from a, a birding perspective. It was actually really good. Oh, cool! Yeah, it's well yeah. worth well worth a watch if you're into yeah. it. Um, I had a, another question that I forgot about, so um, that's not very handy. <laughs> we, we've hit eight o'clock. We should probably start um, thinking about looking at some images, I reckon. Oh, and I was just going to sorry just before we do that. In terms of apps and things, um, I re recently came across. Um, I think it's Merlin, and there's another one that that are. That I wasn't really even aware of, but they're actually pretty amazing little apps just to record what birds you see and where, and that data can then actually be used by others um, in terms of understanding population levels and things like that. Is is there any sort of um, go to tools that you have in that regard, David? Yeah, so eBird is probably the big oh, thing yeah. amongst birders, um, which you know Merlin sort of part of all that Cornell lab, yep. ornithology lab. Um, yeah, I, I must admit I've. Whilst I'm a keen birder and definitely a twitcher as well, um, I you can't do everything, and I find it just too hard to be on there looking at, you know, typing in a list as well as trying to shoot and things. Yeah. So I've, I've definitely become. I've probably always been more of a bird photographer. Uh, that trumps being a bird watcher. Yep. You know, like if for me, if I if I twitch a, a rare species, just going and seeing it isn't good enough for me. I've got to get decent photos of it so i'm not happy until i've done that so it sounds very similar to the relationship here between people at bushwalk and people that like to take photos in the wilderness too and the, the, there's a different yeah. priority set there um so maybe interesting comparison there yeah um, yeah absolutely yeah awesome well yeah well, let's um let's get into the pics then and i'm very keen to see um what you've got for us this evening yeah i'll um so basically feel free to uh, yeah, we've got a ch we've got a chat on the side here and on both channels, David. So anyone can um, throw on some questions, and you don't need to keep an eye on that. We can keep an eye on that for you. Yeah. All yep. right. Uh, now that I've shared my screen, I don't think I've got the chat thing come up anymore. So yeah, I'll let you. That's all right. Yeah, we'll, we'll refer any on that. questions that come it. up. That's all. Yep. Um, look, I've just everyone's uh, saying how I... much I love your t-shirt. Thanks, mate. <laughs> this is from the Broom Bird Observatory. Um, which is a, a cool place, obviously up in Broome. It's a BirdLife Australia reserve where they monitor shorebirds and things. So um, it's actually a really cool um, place. In fact, if I just quickly jump to a photo while we're talking about that, um, bear with me. So yeah, migratory shorebirds are definitely one of those uh, sort of families of birds that get some people excited. Some people get absolutely overwhelmed by them because they all look the same. You know, if you look at that shot there, there's probably four different species in there, but, you know, until really? you look closely, people go, oh, that's just a whole lot of birds. You know, if, if I zoom in for a bit, um, you know, you can see you've got a, a, a red knot here versus a sand plover there. And um, so, yeah, it, I won't get too, too nerdy in on it, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the, the cool thing from um, 
just I think things that most people appreciate is these guys, they're tiny, you know, most of them are only, you know, 15 to 20 centimetres long and they migrate from Australia and Southern Hemisphere all the way up to, you know, Northern Hemisphere, the Arctic, Siberia, all of that sort of stuff, um, which is, is really quite insane, the journeys they do. And um, there's uh, one species, the bar-tailed godwit, has been recorded having the so, longest. I mean, it's, it's a bit bar-tailed. of a Muppet question, David, but yeah. more than just about any other species in the world, they, they travel just massive distances every year, so many different types of migratory birds. What's, what's the main reasoning for that? Like why, why has evolution kind of set them up to take such massive journeys? I, I think it's a bit of an endless summer type mentality uh, because they breed in the summer in the northern hemisphere but then they come down and over you know and spend our austral summer down here so they they also feed on different things so in their wintering ground uh, sorry in their breeding grounds they're more in sort of tundra and stuff whereas down here they're and on their 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 flight paths they're um so i pull up some shots as i'm talking uh, it's a red and extinct real tiny little bird, but they, yeah, they're going to be eating all sorts of things from out of the mud flats and uh, rock shelves and that sort of stuff. Most mostly mud and and you know water. And one of the big issues for all these shorebirds has been in their fly zone, in the flyways from you know northern hemisphere to southern hemisphere. There was places like in Korea and South China Sea and things where. There was these massive expanses of mudflats, which were hugely important feeding grounds on their way up and back. But then you had, you know, countries like Korea, like reclaiming all these mudflats and trying to build houses and things on all these this land that they sort of thought was wasted. Um, and that's that's a big issue for birds all around, but particularly these migratory shorebirds because they they need to fatten themselves up and um, you know eat a lot to be able to make it all the way back up. Um, to the northern hemisphere which is you know yeah it's it's a massive journey so um yeah sorry i'll stop talking about shorebirds <laughs> <laughs> all good and we've got some shorebirds here um and they um always encourage people to walk on the uh not walk on the high tide line because um what's it the um the plover i can't remember the yeah, the hooded plover. Hooded, hooded yeah hooded plover, that's it and and the, the eggs actually um blend in with the sand and if you don't you wouldn't really see them very easily and you can accidentally step on them and yeah um, into that so. So they they run away from the eggs to sort of take the scent off and they leave them vulnerable while they're doing that when, when people come through or animals it's it's really cool you've got some species like red cap plovers that have um what they call a broken wing display so if you go close to their nest they'll I sort of hop along like this flapping their wing looking like it's broken to try and lead a predator away because they think oh that's that bird is injured so i'll follow that one which is incredible people yeah. you know it really is um yeah it's it's pretty full-on so yeah so that's um that's where my t-shirt came from anyway from Burns observatory they did a lot of work yeah studying shorebirds and um this is an asian dowager which is, is you know not a common species but you get them up there each year so um i told about gear and things i thought i'd start with this shot um this is back in i took this in 2003 on my canon 10d the first oh yeah 10d wow 20d yeah so six um six megapixel and uh I shot it all. I shot a, a two-month trip to the Kimberley, all on JPEG, so I didn't know any better um, instead of RAW. And um, yeah, I, I always go to this example when people are talking about megapixels and you need more megapixels and things because um, I've got a, a 24-inch print of this on my wall at home from a six-megapixel JPEG. You know, oh, very and, good, and it looks fantastic. And this was actually the first image that I got into the um, Anzang competition back mm. in its first year. And um, oh, you're a stalwart, far out. Yeah, so <laughs> digital was such a um, a new thing that I had to enter this into the digital category, right? Yeah, uh, right. Because they didn't trust the shifty digital. You don't know what they've done to it. You know, it wasn't like film, and there was such a mistrust of digital, and and rightly so, actually. In in years 
uh, more recent years even that's been shown how um, their mistrust in digital is actually well deserved and what some people do with it but um yeah so that was this is a bit of a, a milestone image for me this is also taken up in the kimberley up in derby speaking of lower resolution too how um the is the bedding community excited by the new development in lightroom in terms of the the enhanced details and and sort of potentially increasing the resolution using ai in that respect or is that sort of a bit more hyped up than than um you know practicality would say yeah, I think, look, it, there's there's very levels of obviously depending on like anything, how much you get into it. And I'm sure, you know, the same with any genre of photography, there'll be people that will be, you know, oh, you've got to use Topaz, you've got to have this, you've got to have that, you've got to have the 500mm lens. And so there's always going to be people that, um, that that's a big deal for. And, uh, you know, I, I'm all for using whatever tool is at your disposal. Um you know, we've mentioned earlier about Topaz Denoise and things, and that's certainly been a, a fantastic bit of software because it really does help overcome some of the inherent challenges of bird photography, needing fast shutter speeds, wide apertures, high ISOs to try and capture the movement and um, all that sort of thing. So, so having a tool that can combat the lack of, of uh, you know, quality in a camera for example in its ISO performance has been really quite you know quite massive in the birding community and wildlife community for sure mm. whereas so, a lot of people still don't know how to use Lightroom and don't understand what that is so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's um it's interesting actually yeah talk about wildlife photography competition so this this image here um, was 2013 Anzang and I won the People's Choice Award, which was really exciting that year because that year, some may remember, was a, a very um, controversial year. Controversial. Oh, that was the year where they had to use raw photos after, like um, sort of scrutiny of the images after that. Yeah, that was the put it this way. The next year, they demanded sort of an original capture as part of yeah. entry because the the winning image that year was, you know, to a lot of eyes, obviously photoshopped and had some issues with the metadata. And you know, was it taken with a twenty four to one hundred five, or was it taken with an eight hundred mil lens? You know, the, mm. the photographer couldn't decide um, and changed their mind and things. And yeah, so that was. Um, that was a big year. I won't get too much into that. Sorry, I'm probably a bit controversial there, but um, <laughs> well, it's probably appropriate. We're talking about Anzang, which which is one of the more I wouldn't necessarily say purist, but it's and now it's known as the Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year, just so people know. Yeah, because yeah. I just feel Absolutely. like people don't necessarily know what we're talking about, and they kind of pride themselves on on the um, I guess purity is a fair enough word of, of their type of images. Um, they're rewarding people's camera craft and their research and their understanding of the subject matter more than probably more than anything else. Yeah. The really cool thing, you know, the thing I've always admired about Anzang Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year is, you know, the, for those that don't know, Anzang was the Anzang Nature Photography Competition that stands for Australia, New Guinea, Antarctica, New Zealand, oh, sorry, Ant Australia, New Zealand, Antarctica, New Guinea. And it's for images taken within that bioregion. So, you know, you've, you've already got obviously the Natural History Museum, you know, the, the UK Award for Worldwide Photography. And, um, you know, Dr. Stuart Miller decided that, well, you know, Australia and, and surrounds has got a very different, you know, flora and fauna. And we don't have these big mammals and things that are, are easy to photograph. And it's just a, yeah, it was a really cool idea. And so certainly uh amongst all the people i know in this sort of genre it it really still is a big deal you know to get into anzang and um yeah it, it's it's really exciting when you when you do get in it and it must be very exciting when you win it oh mate it was <laughs> <laughs> still yeah. pinching yourself <laughs> absolutely yeah. yeah and as you say like just because it was uh i i think what i was excited about and there's the image there i know it's you know i I'm really glad, actually, Paul, that you chose the um, a different image because I'm I'm not sick of looking at this, but I, I don't want it to be like the only photo I've ever taken, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, 
you know, I certainly heard people at the exhibition opening, you know, saying, oh, what the hell is that, you know, or see a nice Photoshop of the wings, you know, flipping them and stuff like that, and and, and which is great. You know, I, I think, uh, as, as you know, for, especially from, say, AIPP awards, you know, it, it's great to have robust debate and, and art is subjective and we've all got different opinions about it and I was just lucky to have the right judges at the right time for that image, you know. Yeah, it is a, it is a little bit of that. There's certainly subjectivity of artists judging art on, to some extent. Um, and is that the shot it came from to the left of that or a similar time? time it was is. Taken? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, if it's not it, it's one of a sequence. I was yeah. rattling off the motor drive. So, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd bring that up because it, it's it talks a little bit about my philosophy, I suppose. I know that you were asking about that before. Mm. With my background, I suppose, with wedding photography is... I've naturally got to be just um, intuitive and reacting to things as it happens, you know, like there's with a, a wedding scenario, yes, you'll plan where you're going to take the, the bridal party shots and whatever, but you, you don't have control necessarily of, of all the elements, obviously you don't always have control of the time or, uh, you know, there's so many factors that, you know, unlike say uh, landscape photography, we go, okay, I'm going to, wait for the light to be in this right place at the right time. And I'm only going to go there when the conditions are good, et cetera. On a wedding, like last weekend, I had two weddings and, you know, the weather was horrendous and you've just got to shoot when you, when you can. And so part of my, of that sort of mentality comes through into my bird photography, I think, whereas I, I won't always have necessarily a huge plan. I won't always just shoot at first light or last light. If I'm out there and something's happening, I'll, I'll shoot it. And this example where this white wing turn, you know, a lot of birds before they are about to take off, they just have a bit of a stretch, put their wings up. And um, yeah, it just happened to be at the right angle. I mean, normally there's no way I would shoot a, a bird from behind. And, and in fact, it was frustrating because in this shot, you know, you can see all the birds are turned around the other way. And because um, they're all facing into the wind and the wind wasn't on my side from where I was coming from and laying down. And so, it was just, yeah, it stretched its wings and rattled off a bunch of frames and it was only afterwards that I sort of was looking through and, you know what, I, I could really make something of that and, you know, a bit of cropping and um, that's it. You, you know, know, like I had to do too much, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I've uh, had to crop in different sort of uh, ratios depending on what I was doing with it because to enter into Anzang, there's uh, a bird there on the right. That, a bit that annoying, bird yeah. on the right. Yeah, I couldn't get the the crop as wide as I would you have. You can't liked. clone its head out. That's for sure. That's yeah. right. That's right. Um, and that's that's the cool thing with competitions. I think is is it forces you to work within the rules, obviously, and uh, that can be challenging. There's so many times where you go, "Oh, damn it! If only I could do this or that." But if that's not the rule of the competition, then that's so be it and so you might have to enter another shot um or in this case yeah crop it a little bit differently to how i'd i'd perhaps really like to and um yeah see how it goes it's interested too in terms of um this particular shot like you mentioned you got you're on your belly or how, how important is it to get low like that and do you like do you find yourself in that position a lot when you're taking your shots <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> <Short answer. laughs> um yeah so birds um like turns on the ground any shorebird uh that's out in an open area you know so you yeah your waders your turns your your gulls etc you you can't hide behind any bushes, obviously. Um, so the only way that you can approach things is by being low. So, you know, laying on your stomach, I'll have my camera on a boogie board. And so I'm pushing the camera out in front of me on a boogie board, either with my tripod with the legs all splayed out uh, dead flat or with a, a thing called a skimmer ground pod, which is basically a little plastic frying pan that you mount your, your tripod head onto. And so... Yeah, it's the only thing you can do and just and you've got to be really slow, you know, and just it can take a lot of time to get out to where the birds are, you know, because you can't just waltz up, you know, at 
standing height and um, walk that 100 metres to get to them and just plonk yourself down in front of them and then lay down, you've, you've got to probably start from, you know, 30, 40, 50 metres out, laying down and, and crawling slowly forward and inching your way and, and, and watching their behaviour, you know, like, again, going back to that wing uh, stretch. In this case, it wasn't the case, but um, when you're approaching a bunch of birds, you, you're always looking for those telltale signs of, okay, are they, have they stopped feeding? Um, are they stretching their wings? Have they just done a big poo? All of those are signs that they know you're there and that they're a little bit, you know, they're either ready to fly or they're, you know, they're thinking about it. So, um, and obviously as a photographer, you don't want them to fly away. You know, no, no bird photographer wants them to, <laughs> to fly off. So, yeah, you're going to do whatever you can to just watch those little cues and then just stop and let them settle again and then wait for them to start feeding. Then you might crawl forward another couple of metres um, and, yeah, see how you go. You must be really good at the commando crawl then. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm pretty short already, so I don't have to get down. <laughs> awesome. uh, yeah, look, and, and again, so going back to the big lens sort of idea that, you know, there is definitely uh, a physical fitness component. You know, not everyone can can lift and wield around the five, 600 mil lens. Um, What's the weight of them? Just yeah. out of interest. Sorry? What's the weight of those lenses generally? Like, uh, that's that's three kilos. Oh, yeah. yeah, the Mark One was three point eight. Um, the cool. new the new six hundred f four Mark Three is about two point nine, I think, okay. um, which is really good. Um, and the balance has improved with them all as well. You know, that's with the heavy. yeah the the Mark One five hundred, the, all the weight was out out the front, and so you'd be you know holding I, for me again short arms all my weight was out there whereas with the the mark ii the weight's back further in so you can tuck your arm back into uh back into your your shoulder and your chest sort of thing which is is much easier to handhold awesome where was that taken by the way the um the winning shot there down at uh lake wallambula down the south coast near Colborough. okay yeah um, certainly one of the things about bird photography is you can do it anywhere. There's always birds around. And so I've been really lucky to, you know, be on some awesome trips around the place and see some amazing things. I mean, um, well, the best thing was obviously, you know, winning Anzang and getting a free trip to the sub-Antarctic, which was pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's you're joking. Oh, um, so, yeah, seeing, uh, seeing King Penguins on Macquarie Island and having a blue sky morning was just, um, yeah, epic to say the least. Um, and it's, it's, it's really crazy. nice having birds like that that you don't need a big long lens for. Like that's taken with a 16 mil. And 16. Wow. Yeah. So you just you're right up laying on the ground right underneath it, sort of thing. And so yeah, having having species like that and being able to shoot wide and not not the big long lens all the time is just fabulous, you know. Um, in fact, on this trip I hardly shot the 500. I, I was on either 16 to 35 or the 100 to 400, and that was all you needed. Yeah. So yeah. Um actually I have was very lucky to have well, there's another shot just to give you a sense of scale um this is lusitania bay down on macquarie island and that's oh, less than a quarter of the beach and they reckon there's a hundred and ten thousand pairs of king penguins there um, which is just yeah awesome in fact that was <laughs> we in a zodiac and uh, trying to keep the lenses dry, as I'm sure you guys know, you're in a zodiac in sort of rough seas and terrible weather, and trying to keep the front element dry. And we started to sort of get pushed in towards the shore, and we got right in about the sort of near the breakers, and the the engine cut out, and the guy oh. driving the, the boss in the other boat was like, "Get the f out of there!" and you know, screaming and poor guys like try to rip the, the zip cord on you know get the motor started and, and it was it was actually quite hairy there for a minute we were right down you know in in this area here just about to sort of be taken into to these uh, beach full of elephant seals and king penguins and it yeah, just started in time we zoomed back out and uh yeah it was uh it was awesome <laughs> 
Mm. Yeah. I, I, what, what kind of response would you have got from those uh, sea lions there, mate? <laughs> oh, the good, pretty, those guys would have been pretty inquisitive. They weren't any big, big males there. So that's all right. It's the, the big males are the ones you've got to worry about. Um, yeah. I, I'm actually talking about penguins and things. How, I was like, how'd you go with the smell, David? Oh, mate. <laughs> They are revolting, aren't they? Seriously, an elephant seal colony is the most revolting thing ever. It's and yeah, no, I don't. I'm not going to describe it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, uh, I actually lost a GoPro in the Falklands somewhere in an elephant seal colony. Um, yeah, and there's no way I was going back to find it. it was, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I was. I was very lucky, um, Scott Patelli, who you guys know, um, asked me to help him lead a trip down to the Falklands a couple of years ago, a few years ago, which was uh, also really epic. And that also gave an opportunity to get some shots that are, you know, behavioural like this with a really long lens, um, but then also, again, use some really, uh, you know, wide angle but technical off-camera flash stuff, mm. which was something that I've always wanted to do, but it's very difficult with birds because you can't, you know, they don't often stay still for long enough. So yeah. you know, uh, this shot, again, wide angle, sunrise, hoping for a better sunrise, to be honest. Um, but I had my tripod with a flash on it. I sort of plonked my tripod down, you know, a metre or two to my right and, um, you know, with a remote trigger and, yeah, tried to get some shots with, um, you know, lighting up the penguin to balance the uh, the sunrise. So. Yeah, that was reminds me a bit of of what you were talking about in terms of them not staying still enough because um, it reminds me of that taxidermied taxidermied animal that was entered into that um, competition um, a couple of years ago, I think. Yeah, the anteater. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) and and overcoming some technical challenges in probably a a not very um, um, kosher way. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) yeah, that's the thing that really amazes me about. photography competitions is the lengths people will go to to lie cheat steal their way into winning and i just yeah like obviously like i said there's, there's times when you go oh funny i could clone this or do that but at the end of the day yeah like i just don't get the mentality that goes i'm going to get the stuffed anteater and pretend it's real and you know yeah, it just doesn't make sense to me, I must admit. But anyway. Does it um do you come across um certain photographers that um like uh, sort of employ baiting or or like to attract birds and I, I guess in you know is there a line there in terms of like what's what's okay and what's not okay or is it a, a bit like um in landscapes where um you know there's we have different um, levels of um, ethics in terms or ethics or uh, approaches to, to what's how much can be done to a photograph, I suppose? Yeah, look, the, the, the ethical debate around bird photography is uh, sometimes quite fierce. There's, like, like any genre or, or group or interest group, there's always going to be people that have um, this that like to have this moral high ground, if you like, and there are people that are completely amoral, you know, like there's, yeah, there's the people that will happily stuff, get a stuffed anteater into their shot. There's people that, you know, um, won't use any kind of attractant or whatever, you know, to, to bring a bird in. And between those two levels, there's a whole lot of different things that, excuse me, that people will do and with varying degrees of um, acceptance, if you like, you know. So um, uh, baiting, for example, you know, if you go on a, on a seabird trip, a pelagic trip um, on a boat to try and see, you know, albatross and shearwaters and things like that, and I'll try and bring up an albatross photo if I can while I'm talking about that, um, you know, that they will chum from the back of the boat and they'll put out, you know, shark liver oil or, you know, fish heads and things to try and attract the birds because obviously, you know, you're out in the middle of the ocean and you want to bring some birds in close to you. And mm. so it's like the sort of the fishing trawler mentality, that, you know, that's always got birds around it. So, you know, most people that I know would find that 
acceptable because, you know, the birds aren't habituated to anything. They're like any, like any. Opportunistic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Opportunistic. Yeah. Things are there. So they're going to come into it while it's there and then, you know, they'll see more birds and that's just how they survive. It's like, you know, you may have seen recently that the other day that um, blue whale getting uh, hunted and killed by orca over in Bremer Bay in WA. Did you guys see that video? I didn't actually see that. Yeah. Oh, mate, insane. Only, I think, the third record of a blue whale predation event by orca. Um, and it went on over hours. But the the number of birds and uh, other things that that scene attracted, it's just how things in the ocean work because... Mm. It, it's like your vultures come into a killing the Serengeti, you know, it, they're just, that's how the ecosystem works. Mm. Um, so, so most people, and again, not, not all, but most people wouldn't have a problem with that. And you could say that that's baiting. Um, whereas if you put a, a mouse in the snow, a mouse in the snow tied to a piece of string um, for a great gray owl in you know, North America, then you would find that most people would find that unacceptable you know, that sort of level of baiting and um, yeah. So th- th- there's that, that's probably the, the more obvious sort of line. Mm. Most people will put water out for birds and yeah, you know, especially you see a lot of people when, when it's really hot, when the weather's going to be really hot, people go, Oh yeah, make sure you fill up your bird bath and get water in for birds. Um, but then sometimes those same people won't put out seed for birds and so, yeah, Australia, we've got a, a really interesting sort of uh, mentality when it comes to feeding. Like in, so Europe, North America, the, the whole feeding aspect, putting out seed and feeders and, you know, hummingbird feeders, whatever, is, is absolutely accepted and encouraged by even the, the birding groups, you know. Um, whereas in Australia, it's much more frowned on and... Personally, I don't really get it because, again, you know, I, I put some seed out every now and again from the, you know, the birds out back of my place and get king parrots and things coming in. Um, and just recently I had put some seed out. The king parrot was busy feeding in the tree, eating berries from the privet across the creek, you know, and not interested. And, and like you said before, Luke, you know, birds are, are opportunistic. They're going to go where it is, and if it's not there, they'll they'll go somewhere else. You know, it's um. I remember a few years ago, we were out in Western Queensland, um, photographing this guy actually, a grey falcon, and you know, really remote out Diamond Sea National Park, and there was this little water hole, and over the course of the few days that we were there, the water hole dried up, and the last afternoon, these spinifex pigeons were coming in, and they were literally sucking up mud. In their, oh. in their bill, you know, and you thought, well, what are they going to do tomorrow? But that's nature. You know, there's plenty of them around. They're obviously used to doing that. And so I, I think personally, I think a lot of times people can be a bit um, uh, anthropomorphism, you know, in terms of how they, they see what birds are doing and they uh, maybe not, how do I say it? I'm probably a bigger picture sort of person, you know, like I, you see nature happen and you see nature is raw and real and it finds a way, you know. And so for me, putting a little bit of seed out or a bird bath, et cetera, I personally have no problem with that whatsoever, um, whereas other people do. So that's, yep. yeah. So the ethics is, is definitely. What about um, also um, playing bird calls and that is that a bit of, that's probably a no-no? Like... Yeah, well, same, same deal. It, it's yeah. a... It's probably again that in between sort of feeding and the the baiting, you know, putting the yep. mice, mice yep. out for a rat. It's probably in uh, for now. That's probably in the middle there. Yep. And there's definitely some really uh, vocal um, people against that sort of thing. And again, it's like anything. It can be uh, done badly. And the, the problem with a lot of these things is that there's no real science behind it. And so a lot of these things are people making opinions about things without really being scientifically studied. You know, like um, scientists doing surveys for various species will often use call playback to try and, you know, uh, work out whether that species is present, you know, for our, our surveys or whatever. Um, so uh, typically the worst 
that people will see happens in an area where people play core playback a lot for a certain species. You know, a certain location might get really uh, well known for a certain bird and everyone goes to core playback it. Um, is they just stop responding, you know? So you generally find that the birds are still around, but they're just not going to come running out because... Cried wolf too many times. Yeah, that's right. And they, they know it's not anything to worry about. So, um, yeah, jumping for a step, for people who don't understand what we're talking about, um, on apps, you know, there's a couple of bird apps and things now that have bird calls. And so if you play a certain species call through a little Bluetooth speaker or something, you'll often elicit a response from that bird, um, sometimes inquisitive, sometimes territorial. Uh, but basically the aim is to bring that bird out of the bush so that you're not trampling through the bush to find it. You're just letting the bird come to you, boom, get your photo and away you go. Now, some people will play that call for hours on end, you know, like where's the bird? Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. And, and I think that's not only counterproductive, but I don't think that's, you know, helpful at all whereas if you are are sensitive to the calls you're playing sensitive to the volume and sensitive to the length of time that you're playing it um, then I think it can be a really good tool to uh, you know be able to show people a cool bird you know and that's the thing a lot of people want to see cool birds and for me encouraging people to interact with nature and with our environment in a positive way is fantastic you know if no one will care about anything no one will want to protect anything they can't see you know and you guys know that with the whole idea of the tarkon you know think back to the old pete Dombrowski and his image of the franklin you know like no one knew what it looked like until they saw a photo and it's by people engaging with nature that people grow to love it and want to protect it and so yeah i suppose that's where my ethical line is mm. you you see so much as you guys know you know habitat destruction you know chain clearing with bulldozers just vast expanses and it's just so depressing and for me if i can take someone out play a bit of call playback and get them to see a species that makes them go wow we're going to save this area or something then that's absolutely worth it mm. and and people you know, there'll be people that will absolutely disagree. There'll be people throwing things at the, <laughs> at the screen, I'm sure. <laughs> I, think, I mean, but that's why I'm sort of in, interpreting that is, um, you know, it's a pragmatic approach, but the, at the end of the day, you don't want to be altering the the bird's behaviour overall. And, and so if it can be done in a way where it's, um, yeah, it's not not otherwise changing how they would go about their their usual business, I suppose, then... then um, yeah, you know, and the, the reality is... As soon as we enter into their territory, as soon as they see us and want to move away from us, we've already altered it. We've already mm-hmm. altered their behaviour. We've yeah. already interrupted what they're doing. Yep. So, you know, if, if you want to go all the way, you've got to say, well, we actually shouldn't be going out in the bush at all. Mm. You know, we shouldn't be disturbing them on any level. We should just be, you know, locking them up and closing the gate, just letting them go about their business. And there are some people that absolutely think, yeah, absolutely, I'm fine with that. That's the best way to go. Um, but I'd probably come back to that that broader, that bigger picture where, you know, you just have to look at the news and your news feed or whatever and see how few people actually give a crap about nature. And if, if we can bring some people that are over here a little bit over there, that's so much more important than attacking someone that's already over here that might use too much poor playback or something that's you know we're, we're on the same team if you know mm. what i mean um, very similar um conversations in landscape photography as well actually in terms of locations and and places yeah. so it's a it's a definitely an echoing of a very similar type um a scenario that that plays out um in certain areas so um yeah it's a and i think it's a debate for the ages those sort of those sort of things it's um absolutely you know, I think there'll never be a it's, it's such a gray area that um it's you know you can't um you know that you can't unravel it or, or tie it back up again so um it's just uh, the way it is yeah yeah interesting um, yeah um just talking about impact and that sort of thing so um this is another probably favorite image of mine which actually isn't a bird and it's a dead animal but it's 
Well, I'm, I'm really stuck with this for a number of reasons. Like one, I just really liked the image visually, you know, like I, we did a trip down to Bruny Island uh, a few years ago and I'd had some friends who had been there sort of the week before me and um, same sort of time and, and they got some cool shots of, you know, quolls and, and some roadkill shots where, you know, that, that more well-known sort of aspect where on, you're on ground level look at the thing with a long exposure and the car tail lights going mm. past that sort of thing, you know, which look at, you know, we've, we've seen it a thousand times, you know, like in, in, and it's a cool shot and it can be really powerful, but I, I was really struck by the creative challenge, I suppose, of well, how, how do we portray a road kill image without being on that ground level of, you know, car light sort of long exposure type thing. And um, yeah, so we unfortunately found this this guy and um yeah had a, a flash on one side down low and a bit of torch light from underneath and um yeah created that and it got me a, a gold distinction at apo which was well huge you know you those, mate. yeah that's that's yeah it was mind-blowing um Though interesting, they've changed the rules in uh, the, the nature photography category after that to uh, not not allow any any sort of uh, man made things in it. So uh, I think there was some obviously some people that didn't like that image. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, it's what happened. So hmm. yeah, yeah, and, and for me, you know, wildlife photography, yes, it's it's great to have these you know pristine environments um, and just where there's nothing except just the habitat that the bird's in or the, the animal's in. But I think some of the most powerful imagery these days and you see in the Natural History Museum and, and also in, in Australian Geographic Nature Photographer of the Year where you've got images like that that, you know, yes, they've obviously got some man-made things in it, but they're telling a much more important story. Mm. And I, I think just it's a bit, I suppose wildlife photography is a bit going, gone through that, um that same question that landscape photography went through is you know uh, is it allowed to have anything man-made in it now and most people obviously say these days yeah of course a landscape can have something man-made in it but you'll still have your pur purists that will say no it's got to you know it's got to only have the natural environment in it and i think the same with wildlife photography no, it's, it's um, important to have those pieces that, that um, you know, keep the conversation about those, um, you know, I think but Tassie's got one of the highest rates of roadkill in the world and um, there's are, there are solutions to avoid that from happening. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that keeps that conversation going. So it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, sorry, I've got a, actually I'll just one more of that. I saw the um, devil shot there, by the way. Congrats on the current cover of the Oz Geo as well. Thanks, mate. Yeah, yeah. It was that's another bucket list sort of uh, dream Achieving, moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and well done for you, all the shots in it. You're a, a seasoned, you know. Oh, yeah, I've yeah, been buff. lucky to be tapped on the shoulder a couple of times, so that's always yeah. been nice. <laughs> no, that was, that was pretty exciting, actually. And I know you had Heath on... Heath Holden on recently and, yeah. uh, you know, he will obviously know that this is, you know, a captive captive animal. You know, this was up at Aussie Ark in the Barrington Tops, uh, which is a, a, obviously a, a captive population with the idea of, you know, yeah, building a mainland ark of not just devils now. It's called Aussie Ark now instead of Devil Ark. But, yeah, they, you know, again, I really... Uh, I love the work that they do and what they're trying to achieve and some it's a, a, a cause sort of that I, I feel is worth supporting and it's nice to be able to to get up and you know, get some shots for those guys and um, yeah do something with your photography that's not just for your own personal gain or mm -hmm. accolades or whatever you know it's nice to have some shots that that you're happy with professionally um, and creatively but they're also you know, doing good, you know, like um, this shot was auctioned off at one of their gala dinners a few years ago and, you know, got a few grand for um, their, their efforts and, you know, they, they raise heaps for it. But it's, yeah, it's a really nice feeling, you know, when you can, can give back like that. Mm, definitely. And I've noticed too, I mean, obviously your, your um, skills in 
portraiture and, and events and that with using the flashes obviously come in handy with some of these kind of shots as well it's probably a flash isn't probably something that a lot of landscape photographers would have sitting around in their kit generally so it's nice to have that sort yeah, of nice that too. lighting and really be able to bring out the texture and detail um, that's there yeah i have really enjoyed i haven't been able to do it very much but i have really enjoyed those opportunities when you can you know, get some off-camera flash and I don't know how well the detail shows up there, but, um, well, well, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it's super sharp again, using a 16 mil lens and, you know, at F, whatever it was. Um, I've got the the scene there, I can't see it, but, um, yeah, you know, I think that's, that's really cool. Um, and it's, it's nice. Yeah. Definitely trying to bring in your, the wedding portrait skills, into that genre you know it's yeah i i really enjoyed it i really enjoyed it in the falklands particularly um with those king penguin shots yeah uh, with, yeah just really really cool fun but then there's, there's still those behavioral uh, images like that that you want to capture um which again 100 or 400 lens not not the big 500 because you want to capture a bit more of the scene and see all the birds in it um yeah, they're some of my favourites as well. And I think, again, going back to the wedding aspect, my work I think is pretty eclectic in that, um, you know, like I mentioned Jan Wegener number four, like he's got a very distinct style and I love that about Jan's work. You know, he's, you know that's Jan's work and he, and he sticks with that style and he does it very, very well. Um, I'm probably... I don't know, I've got ADHD or whatever, but um, I, I can't sit still. I can't do the same thing. I, you know, I, I just have such a – I'll try and capture what I can when I can, you know what I mean? Um, yes, I, I love the, the wide-angle, spacious, landscape esque shots, um, but I'll also love that, you know, that nice, clean portrait yep. um, and, and everything in between. And That's the um, Lord Howe Woodhead? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, that was um, another one from Manzang a few years ago. Um, uh, they actually had them all um, packed away when I was there because they were doing the um, the mouse pro- uh, the rodent project. So, yeah. So hopefully that's um, been successful and should um, help them help them out a bit. Oh mate, it is awesome. We were there um, about two months, two and a half months after they'd done the baiting, and yep. they just released a sample set of Lord Howe wood hens to do some toxicology to let them feed and then get some blood samples to see whether there's any, you know, bait in their blood, etc. Oh, yeah. And um, so we were lucky because we had a workshop and obviously people want to see the wood hens. So <laughs> it was great that they'd released a few and we, we knew where they were and we got some shots. This was the year before that. But, yeah, um, yeah even that year, even only a couple of months after they'd been, you know, like sort of declared to, to have worked so far. Um, things like emerald doves were, were nesting and breeding up in bigger numbers. You know, marked boobies had, had started nesting on the main island, which they haven't done for decades, you know. Wow. Um, and that was, yeah, that was a couple of years ago now. So I'm, I can't wait to get back there this December and see what it's like because from all accounts, it's been awesome, you know, seeing, um, yeah, seeing, seeing what's happened. That's brilliant. Um, this is actually a, a still from a video from a GoPro. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, right. um, it's actually not not that sharp, but it's just it's a really I just really like the shot. You know, they're so inquisitive these birds. I just had the the GoPro out on a selfie stick and just sort of put it down in front of them, and they were <laughs> tapping it, and you know they'd, they'd love the noise that the tapping on the on the screen would make, and um, yeah, it was was good fun. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to use whatever I can in terms of equipment and try and look for different shots when I can. It um, must, be a, it must be an amazing trip, um, just thinking about all the birds that I did see over there and you know, the abundance. So it must, yeah, must be a great place to take people. Oh, it really is. And, it's, and uh, the, the great thing is about it that everything's accessible, mm. you know. Um, people can get up close to things. So, uh, and that comes back to that that attracting sort of thing like uh, it's really hard to take people to see things this is something bird watching guides have struggled with for, for decades you know is yeah you've got paying clientele that want to see stuff 
and you want to be able to deliver. So there is that really big pressure to get things that are, say, habituated or whatever. And, and you know, I mean, you've only got to see Admiral documentaries to, you know, behind the scenes to know how much of that is, is sort of with habituated or captive animals and things just because that's what you want to be able to see and that's easier to film. So, um, yeah, so I did... Um, Talk about post processing or jumping a little bit. Do you want to yeah. move on to something about that for a minute? Or yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, it's probably just a, again a before and after sort of shot. Um, well, yeah, you know. So if I just bring up the two of them. Um, that's one of I think going back to that the feathered symmetry, the wings shot. I. I think some of my best work happens on the computer, you know, and I, and I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of, you know, having the ability to, to capture something like that, but then trans, you know, transpose it over into something that looks like that, uh, I think is really important. And I think that's, that's a skill that a lot of bird photographers lack, you know, they're, they're so focused on getting the shot, getting it in focus, Etc., and then they forget about the post production side of things. And so, you know, one thing I'd probably say to encourage everyone, you know, same with landscape photography or whatever genre, you know, that everything can always be enhanced a bit in post production, whether it's just by cropping out distractions, um, you know, lifting the exposure, adding a bit of contrast, making it more high key, etc. You know, I think that's a really often overlooked skill, you know, in, in, wildlife photography particularly i'm interested actually i mean i can see that there's a, quite a crop there and i know a lot of cameras have the a, a function to be able to put it into APS-C mode i mean is that um advisable or is it better just to shoot um and then crop later anyway i'd personally always use the full sensor and crop later yeah because yeah you never know when you might actually want to use you know, that horizon or something like that, yeah. you might actually want to include that in the shot. So because it's it's if it gave you the same megapixels or something cropped, then, yeah, absolutely, there'd be times yeah. I'd go in the crop mode. But since it's actually cropping the sensor the same as you would crop the image in Photoshop or Lightroom later, I, I don't see the point. You yeah. know, memory cards are cheap, hard drives are cheap, you know, yeah. shoot yeah. big, you know. Except for the new cards for the R5, they're not cheap. <laughs> yeah you're right actually mate <laughs> oh my god i was like what how much yeah i know man the the 256 gig sony cf express card for the r5 i bought from b and h in the states and it was still 700 bucks <sighs> i was gonna say it's more like a thousand i thought you must have got a good deal yeah well quick tip memory cards if people buy memory cards b and h in the states is always the cheapest that's always my go-to for memory cards um yeah what's the i to quickly digress because I, yeah. I consider doing that what's the um cutoff for like purchasing something from there where you get don't get slammed by um importing duties and stuff like that these days whatever you buy they seem to add the duty to it automatically now automatically um, yeah, right. which so that's why for a lot of things like gear you, you know it's actually not not worth it these days um yeah, that's what I was asking. Asking. yeah yeah, memory cards still seem to be definitely a, an advantage in, in doing it. So um, I've got some really good deals off Amazon too, actually, as well. Um, just by you can put price watches using different plugins and things, and yeah, been able to get some very very good deals. Um, if you yeah. wait for the prices to drop, yeah, yep, absolutely. Um, yeah, look, there's always <laughs> there's always more gear we want to buy, isn't there? It's never ending. <laughs> And just when you think you've got everything you need, then they'll drop something else and then you're back to square uh, one. <laughs> exactly. I, I remember, you know, shooting, I had a 1D Mark IV and when I had that, I was like, oh, I, I don't need an, another camera. This is this is the camera that will last me forever. You know, this is, it can't get any better than this. And then they brought out the 1DX and I played with that. It's like, take my money. <laughs> You know, and they do. They keep getting better and better. And, and like we said, yeah. you know, current mirrorless stuff. It's just again, it's awesome. 
I even just think of that with Sony. I mean, when I, I started shooting Sony, I think in 2015, and there would have been probably a handful of lenses available at the time. And they just announced their 60, 63rd lens um, today or the other day. Um, wow. So the amount of amount that they're able to produce and put out in that amount of time is yeah. pretty staggering when you Busy. look back yeah. on it all. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell us more about how you, how you got the shot, David? Yeah. So, again, if I haven't got the original there, actually, I'm sorry, but um, so this is a cassowary at Eddie Bay, which is, again, going back to the habituated thing, it's actually quite habituated to humans and, uh, you know, can be seen strutting on the beach sort of thing. Um, How big is that? Oh, they're, they're, I mean, I was crouching down there, obviously, um, but they're, they're a big bird. Wow. They're, they're pretty dangerous too, are they, or is that more of a myth? Or um, Look, there's only been one recorded death, uh, I think it was like 1936 or something like that, and that was two kids in North Queensland trying to attack it with a club. Oh, yeah. And one of the kids ran away and tripped over and, you know, end of story sort of thing. There, there's been a lot of attacks but no real serious sort of injuries. They, they can definitely be aggressive and, and especially... Uh, birds that are habituated and are used to being fed, no doubt. And they are an intimidating bird for sure. You know, like, yeah, the the big claw and their their front toe is is massive, and they're just they've just got this I don't know this really intense look in their <laughs> eye. And I reckon, yeah, yeah, they just they they really they're intimidating, prehistoric and intimidating. Um, but they're also very just typically fairly calm and slow moving but yes they can definitely uh, I, I do know of people for sure that have been bailed up by them and you know in areas up in north queensland like where they're a bit habituated things but this guy was just sort of walking out of the forest and um probably a good tip about using manual exposure often you know if i was on an automatic mode absolutely would have blown the exposure because the contrast difference between the bird and the background was, you know, how many stops probably you could probably tell me how many stops. Um, but it was, it was massive. And so exposing manually for the highlights, you know, try not to blow out that, that pale blue area on the side of its head there. Um, yeah. I to get really a dramatic sort of lighting effect, which, yeah, I, I was really happy with. I really liked that yeah. shot. Um, sort of suits that um, intimidating sort of presence, doesn't it? The very dramatic sort of light there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you guys tell me, what is there anything that um, that you direction you'd well, like I just to think before, I just had a thought, like um, we, we sort of touched on this there a bit, but, you know, so maybe choose an image or two where and take us through the process of creating it. Like I knew to be there because it was a season and, you know, I approached from this angle because it was downwind or or this is a lens I knew I needed or you know, this took an hour to get and I and I waited for this behavior to happen or, you know, like this is pretty much all of these are at this setting. Like just maybe something that yep. brings people into the process of creating an image and, and might empower them to maybe go out and apply that themselves. So that, again, varies massively all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there will be shots. Uh, look, that there's probably very few shots in there that are really premeditated. Um, this shot is a shot that I wanted to get for a long time, and it didn't really. It wasn't exactly the shot that I wanted, um, but it was close to. I'd had this idea of you know a wide angle shot of Casper in the beach and things, and my dream shot is actually cassowary sunrise on the beach yeah. wide angle say, yeah, off camera cool. flash and blah blah blah. you know sort of like that king penguin shot you know i'd love yeah you know, just be, be epic, epic. And, and that's yeah. probably more a camera trap sort of set up like you know Heath yeah. and i got some mates who do some amazing camera trap stuff and i just don't have the patience for that mate to be honest um so so the shots like that but a lot of it comes really from sort of i suppose just being there like uh, going to see, you know, like the peregrine falcons um, nest every year, 
in a couple of places, you know, a few places along the coast, even around Sydney and, you know, knowing roughly where they are and, and being patient, you can get them flying past and, and manage to get a cool shot. Um, yes. But other times it's just, you know, well, I'm, I'm at this place, I'm going to get up early for sunrise and I'm going to see what's going to happen. And, you know, I might get this bandit stilled out by itself or I might get it in a flock or, you know, and, and just reacting accordingly, you know, like obviously when they're coming in closer, I'm going to get a tight shot um, like these and make the most of that really beautiful light and the still crystal, you know, water. Uh, whereas other times you just won't have those conditions. And it's, uh, in fact, the night before that shot, the afternoon, we, we'd gone down there to see, this is in um, uh, northwest Victoria, and going back to the twitching thing, there was a, a bird called a long-billed dowitcher that is similar to the bird on my T-shirt, but this was the first time this particular species had been recorded in Australia, and it was also unusual in that it was in full breeding plumage when it should have been in non-breeding plumage. So it had obviously got its whole body clock direction completely out of whack. And so a mate and I drove 1,000k each way to, to see this bird for a weekend. And um, the first afternoon we got there and it was pissing down with rain. Like we, we were sitting out on the edge of this horrible mud flat, you know, on this salt lake and um, just getting drenched. And that was the first time I actually got water in my 1DX you know, we're just <laughs> sitting in the rain. Um, but then the next morning it cleared up and it was, it was magic. You know, we, we got this amazing light and it was really still and calm and beautiful. Um, and then eventually once the light went crap, we eventually found the right bird. <laughs> um, so so one, one question I might, so if we start thinking about the end of the show, what do we, we want to leave people with? Mm. Uh, what I think might be really nice is just to touch base on some of the key areas in Australia that really highlight areas for, I know there's, depending on the species you want and the time of year, but there are some areas, you know, like Kakadu, for instance, is, is quite renowned at a certain time of year for, to be a brilliant place. Is it just a, maybe a, a few touchstones or some broad points and then maybe a couple of places or clubs or organisations where people might be able to join in or, or find out more about and learn more about birds or go out on, you know, with some with some twitches or some bird watches, they want to sort <laughs> of put a couple a questions as well. on, on all this. Yeah, so um, where to go? Like when you start getting into the birds, like getting an app like uh, Pizzy and Night app on your phone that you know has bird field guide instead of being a, a book is great, and that will help you to learn the species. And then once you you know, what was that called? The species, uh, Pizzy and Knight, uh, okay. Field Guide well, in Birds uh, of Australia. Yeah. Um, and there's a Morecambe, Michael Morecambe does another app as well. So firstly, like just learning the birds and knowing where they are and picking out, you know, obviously certain species you've got to go to a certain place. It doesn't matter what time of year, you've just got to be in that area. Um There'll be, you know, Kakadu, obviously you, you're really limited in the wet season because of all the water and you can't get into place and it's closed. So it's a great spot to be in the dry season. And then you'll start thinking, okay, well, if I want to get shots of say, um, uh, where's my, say Gordian finches or something like that. Um, wow. They will come, you know, like uh, lots of finch species and lots of bird species will come to water. So, uh, rather than putting out your own water or food or whatever, if you go to somewhere where there's a small body of water, a small water hole or a puddle even at the right time of year, so say the end of the dry season when the water is more scarce and so the, the amount of available water is receding and boards, birds are forced to be in, in smaller areas, uh, that's, you know, the best time to go so you can get get them coming into these spots. Um, this, um, this was taken – or actually – about a week before COVID hit last year yeah. and um, went up to catch up with a mate, uh, Laurie Ross, who runs Bird Photography Tours across the top end and, and uh, Queensland. And we um, went up there specifically because it was the breeding season. Just after the wet, it was bloody hot, you know, mid-30s and humid as hell. Um, but all the finches were getting really into breeding and so they were in their best plumage and they looked absolutely schmick, you know. Um, just so pretty. So there's 
there's times like that where you go, okay, well, the plumage matters. I really want to go this time of year. But obviously, they're not coming to water, so you've got to find them in other ways. And you've got to find where they're nesting and things like that. Is that in um, the western top end, or is it, um, where's the best place to see a Gordian? Um, look, you can get them right across. There's, okay. This was near Catherine. Okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, across, you can get them, you know, north of Broome, uh, across through the Kimberley. But, yeah, okay. probably just north of Catherine, sort of Edith Falls sort of way is, is yep. one of the best, best spots to see them. Cool. Um, yeah, they're, they're just an insane bird. Like it's mm. just it's just not real. It's a colour fest, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but see then, you know, you've also got species like variegated fairy wrens, which, you know, I'm in Sydney, you can get at Lancaster National Park, you know, like they're not hard birds to see. Um, but they're often overlooked because they're small and if you don't go out looking for them, you know, you're not going to see them. Um, but, you know, get the right, get some waddle in the background and uh, colours really pop. So um, I've got a question I, I on, guess... on YouTube actually just about um, how you sort your photos. So like um, just in terms of the hierarchy, do you go by bird species or just the location you went to? Or like um, I'm assuming you're probably pretty good with keywording as well. Uh, I would like to think that I would be better <laughs> at keywording. <laughs> keywording, uh, yes. So firstly, my folder structure, I, can you see the left-hand side of my screen there? Yeah, I think I'll um, be able to make that out. Um, if I make that bigger, does that? No, it probably doesn't help. But basically, I shoot in year, month, day. So I'll have a folder <laughs> that is you know, 2021-03-15 and then a descriptive name, say, you know, Lachlan Shire or, you That's know. Basically the concept. location. And then yeah. would you recall what you shot at a particular location so you just go straight to that folder perhaps? Yeah, exactly. Or yeah. if it's something really special, then, yeah, I'll probably put keywords in for all those images when I, uh, you know, when I enter them. Yeah. Um, the keywords is something that, yeah, the sheer volume of images I take, I'm not very good at it and it's something I need to be a lot better at. But having having that descriptive name for me helps a lot, you know. Yeah. Even the oh, location. You have to click each folder to see what's in there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I don't separate into bird species in a folder level. Um, I will just use the keyword for that if I've really got a species I want to find. Um, yep. Generally, at this stage, my memory still works okay, so I can generally remember where things are, um, and it doesn't take me too long to find them. But that's, I'm sure, that won't always be the case. You know, like things like seeing palm cockatoos in Cape York oh, yeah. is not something you forget <laughs> very often. Yeah. 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 Oh, that was that was again a magic time. So yeah, Cape York is a great place for going back to your okay, question. Yeah. You know, far North Queensland in general is awesome for bird species and diversity. You get a, a bunch of species that migrate from PNG um, to there, or that are only found in that Cape York, far North Queensland sort of area. They've got quite a few endemics. Um, yeah. The top end is fantastic. You know, Tassie's got its share of endemics, which is fantastic. So once you get into your birds and, and again get that sort of obsessive compulsive sort of uh, twitching, you know, twitching and, and ticking off the list sort of thing, you, you start to go, okay, well, what haven't I seen here? And you got to go, okay, well, I've got to go to Tassie because I've got to get, you know, green rosella and scrub tit and Tasmanian thornbill and blah blah blah, and you know, um, orange belly parrot and all those sort of but, things. So, David, I think compositionally we haven't really spoken about that much, but to me, one of the more obvious things is being very selective about what's what's in the background. And how to position yourself to to make the subject pop and separate it from the background, or even complement the colours like you did before with the yellows behind the blues. And I think, you know, without painting an obvious picture, it's one of the most important things to creating a striking image. Anyway, would you, do you want to go into that a little bit more? Or? Yeah, mate, absolutely. The positioning is is one of the first things that I'll try and teach people. You know, like. Um, Again, if you go to this shot, great example, actually, the first thing you should do is go a, a step to your right so that you're separating that bird properly from this bird here. Um, so often the background will have something that at first may not seem obvious, but 
when you shoot it wrong, it's very obvious in the background that, oh, if only I had have moved literally a step to the left or a step to the right, et cetera. Um, and that can make, can make a huge difference. You know, things like even the, you know, the background out of focus yeah. area, you know, in this bulger shot, like having the bird sort of centred around that highlight circle is going to be different to if you had have had the head sort of half over that darker barrier and that lighter area, you know. So, yeah, one of the things that people... Or, or having the focus point on the beak instead of on the eyes, you know, like... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and sometimes that you won't have enough control over that and that's yeah. where a good camera will come into it for sure. But sometimes, you know, you sort of are at the mercy of the camera a lot with that sort of stuff. Um, and that's where the eye detect autofocus in the new, the new breed of cameras from all the brands is, is just unreal. Um, so, yeah, background's really important. Um, yeah, sorry, Paul, what was that the other point you made there? Oh, I, don't present, I think it's, a, yeah, all the... You know, the colours that you choose as well relative to the subject, I think is quite a significant one. Yep. So things like, um, you know, cockatiel, red earth background, this is out near Lake Cajeligo. That for me, you know, that real rich, earthy, red soil country evokes that outback sort of notion. And so, I, and it really plays in with the orange spot on the, on the, male's cheek there and so that sort of thing can be really important um sometimes you know like this green cat bird on on green just using all those really complementary colors can work really well and you know the red eye pops and things so yeah absolutely i think color color can be really really important you know um i, I love color and, and you know the the gang gang shop for example overcast day exposed manually for the bird not the background um, and just the simple red, grey, white, you know, um, yeah, it just makes it a, an interesting image. So, yeah, colour colour for sure can be, be really cool. Composition and space uh, is definitely really important. Um, this, is, this is a bit of a work in progress. This is the first opportunity I've had to sort of shoot with a drone, birds with a drone, wow. um, and not have them, you know, scared, obviously. Um, and get that, yeah, you probably remember that classic camel shot from National Geographic back in the day, you know, from the aerial shot showing the, the shadows. Um, yeah, I, I've always wanted to sort of try and replicate something like that. And, um, yeah, getting there, it's, it can definitely be a lot better, but it was, was fun to capture, again, using a drone rather than, than a 500 mil. And just allowing a bit of breathing room seems to be at least a part of your style, if not many people's, you know, like there's, there's tight and there's allowing, allowing a resting point, you know, to cushion it around the image and give it a bit of breathing room. Yeah. I, I've always loved space in my images. You know, I, um, yeah, it, it's, there's definitely times when, yeah, you'll get, you know, something quite tight. That's just that, um, you know, really clean portrait, long lens, soft background sort of look, you know, that really, uh, you know, typical bird photography sort of, you know, nice field guide type shots. Um, but, yeah, definitely something where that captures a sense of the space and, oh, um, and, and an element of composition I think is really important. You know, I think that's something, again, a lot of people don't look at. They, they take the photo. They're just so focused on getting the bird in the centre of the frame and getting it as big as possible. Uh, you know, like I've had a lot of people that they've, they've got a zoom lens and they're, they're so focused on getting it close that, you know, they've taken these shots and they've actually cropped off half the bird, even with a zoom lens, they could have just pulled out and got the whole bird in. And uh, so composition is something that I think doesn't come naturally to everybody. And yeah, that's a really important thing to look at. And that's something that I certainly enjoy that aspect of and something with the AIPP that I've really enjoyed being part of that community and that judging process with the awards, you know, again, as you guys would know, it, it's, it pushes you to think better, you know, no, that's probably not the right word, but you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, this one yeah, too, it's yeah. a great sense of timing as well, isn't it? Just to uh, get the one running on the left there, just in the right 
the right position and yeah, everything's just spaced so well there. It's, well, it's remarkable. My first thought is also, you know, they're often in quite complex environments. So how do you simplify it visually? Because uh, yeah. often, you know, if they're in trees and the trees behind us, so much structure everywhere and overlapping sort of features that could easily pull your eye away from the subject. You've, you know, there's the obvious use of, of bokeh to, to soften and to separate that, which, which yeah. is a lot to do with your positioning as well as your focal length as well as light, as well as, you know, the choice of color separation, but, but yeah, just thinking always, I guess, how to simplify and, and clarify that that's the subject that you're, that you're wanting to present and explore, you know, so people aren't pulled in all sorts of different directions. Yeah. And, and that's definitely something that comes naturally with the big lenses, you know, just by default, you will get that really creamy background and you can't help but be drawn just to the subject. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the big, you know, L-series super telephoto lenses definitely give you a bit of a head start there already. Um, you know, if you had shot that same image there with a, a compact super zoom camera, even at the same focal length, because of the smaller sensor and, you know, different optics in the lens, you would have found the background is way sharper and, and automatically more distracting so, yeah, you know, the, the, the 500 and 600mm lenses do give you a bit of a, a cheating head start in, in that sort of sense and make it much easier to isolate the subject from the background. Um, you know, as you can see, again, with this shot, there's nothing done to the background. There's no blurring or anything done. It's just the background was a long way away. Um, and that's another reason for getting down low. And so suddenly, instead of the background being, you know, if you're standing height, shooting down at a bird on the ground, the background's like five centimetres behind it. If you lay down, the background's suddenly 500 metres behind it. And so you can't help but get that depth and separation between the subject and, you know, the background. So, yeah, that's that's definitely a tip for sure, mate. Awesome. We'll probably um, need to look at uh, wrapping things up, unfortunately, but um, I had a, a question, um, you may get it from time to time, but um, do you have like a favourite bird or a favourite kind of um, maybe genus or something like that? Uh, probably one of my favourite birds is the yellow-billed kingfisher, oh, yeah. which is found up on Cape York. Um, took me two visits to see one. They call loudly and it was beautiful trilling call and one was calling around camp first time I went up there and didn't see it and didn't see it till the next time I went. And yeah, it's, I don't have a photo of that handy, but that's a beautiful bird. Generally parrots, you know, cockatoos, raptors, you know, birds of prey, any of those are, are always pretty special. Um, you know, Major Mitchell cockatoos are, yeah. excuse me, spectacular. Um, you know, just like our sulfur crested, except pink with a red and orangey crest, which are just stunning. So, yeah, parrots are definitely, you know, an obvious one. They're always so pretty, and we're very fortunate in Australia to have lots of, of really cool parrot species and cockatoo species. So, yeah. And in terms of um, if people want to see more of your um, uh, bird photography and that kind of thing, uh, it's best to go to your website, um, David, is probably, it davidstow.com? Yep. Instagram is yep. probably where I'm most prolific with the yep. bird stuff. Um, I'm still working of... Yeah, my, my website's yeah, with three website, yeah. progress. Yeah, I've got it, davidstow.com.au uh, and davidstow.com. So .com.au is my older site, which is is almost like, you know, became like a, a species sort of library um, almost. But, yeah, it, it hasn't been updated for some time. So I'm working on davidstow.com. And, um, yeah, or you can go to flockwildlife.com, which is our bird photography tours and workshops and things. Oh, absolutely. But, um, inspired um you can definitely join um david on a tour I'm, I'm assuming you've still got some in the covid world going on and all of that yeah it's it's yeah. been tough um probably done more private workshops recently yeah. which has been fun i really enjoy that actually um yeah we've got a trip to broom in august which is sold out but we've got a couple of spots left in our lord howe trip in december oh wow. yeah, this, this year for various reasons is a bit challenging so we don't have too many um organized trips but um yeah. Yeah, no, it's always fun. I really do love that aspect, actually, of photography, of, of you know, helping people to get better and, and learn more about stuff. So, yeah, it's quite... Borrow, borrow your gimbal. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I remember when I came across Luke Patterson, I was, I was, I was just... He was, like, slinging a gun over his shoulder 
It was just so massive. He just had this swanky technique of just, you know, walking down the, to the boat with it. Like it was just second nature and it was just yeah. absolutely massive. And then he shot on a boat with a tripod and a gimbal and with this very large, very focused like type snoot flash. And yeah. it was just amazing to watch over the shoulder at a master, you know, like on those smooth wetland tours through Kakadu, like there's very little vibration uh, apart from over the engine a little bit. So and if you've got a gimbal as well, and you know, which which reduces a lot of the impact to some extent, it's it was beautiful watching a master at work. Um, that was actually a good question I was going to ask just um, briefly as well around, um, you know, using those um, flashes um, actually just for um, general, um, not just for the wide angle sort of stuff, but more um, crop uh, like telephoto work as well. Is that something that um, is is often used, or you you employ yourself? Yeah, absolutely. There's times when, say, this shot, for example, really dark rainforest environment. And um, I think, uh, so that's, you know, 1,000 ISO, F4, 250 of a second, you know, so not a lot of light. And without flash, the bird would be, you know, really underexposed. Mm. So popping some flash in, and hopefully balancing it with the background is, is often a really, you know, really good skill for sure. A um, little bit of flash can help the bird pop a bit. You know, you've got certain species like, say, Regent Bowerbird that getting detail in the blacks is virtually impossible without direct sun or, or flash. Right. They just absorb light like Birds of Paradise. They just absorb light. Um, but then you've got this bright yellow top of their head and, and nape, which overexposes so easily so they're a real challenge so having some flash to sort of light up the blacks can be really helpful so yeah yeah a bit of bit of flash can work wonders in certain environments but um uh yeah cool yeah, fiona brooke wants you to come visit uh, the far south of new south wales <laughs> yeah tell her i'm coming fee <laughs> <laughs> awesome well um i think we'll probably have to leave it there unfortunately but um we really thank you so much, uh, David, for joining us and um, taking us through um, some absolutely inspiring images there. And um, I'm sure that everyone got a lot out of that um, and um, probably had a few questions answered around their, um, you know, interest in bird photography or maybe you've helped to develop it a little bit more. So, um, yeah, do you have anything else to add to that, Paul? Oh, I'm just really grateful. We, uh, we, we, we popped the question to David's been on our list for quite a while, but we didn't pop the question on him till, till Monday afternoon about <laughs> today. So it was like, Oh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Uh, because, uh, Matt, who we got on next week, uh, decided he couldn't make it because, um, uh, Mika was running a show at the same time. They didn't think they'd be able to have their internet working without stuffing it up. But, um, no, I've, I've wanted to catch up with you for a while, David. I, I've, I've been sorry I didn't get on a, a, a bit earlier just to have a personal catch up. But um, yeah, keep safe up there in the rains. Uh, keep doing this magic work. I, I think, um, you know, for people that want to pursue this, it, it really makes sense to like maybe come out on a tour with you guys and get a real sense of confidence about how to move forward and understanding how to make the best out of the equipment and the different approaches and learning the knowledge around the different species and times of day and crafting the light and because you're right it is, it is quite a specialist approach to to a subject matter and, and, and landscape environment that involves quite a different sort of headspace um but i personally feel a lot more um reminded of how, how to go about that uh after today and uh well i'm probably not going to go by 500 i wish <laughs> i've got an r5 so that's a good start <laughs> get, get the 100 to 500 for Oh, that that is actually way on my radar. Uh, I think yeah. that's going to be a terrific all round lens. It's only it's only five thousand dollars, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Epic lens. But uh, that's yeah, with a, with a converter as well. That that probably puts me into the realm of actually being able to use it functionally uh, for both wildlife and and bird life. Yeah. So um, yeah, thanks for your time, man, and be safe in the rains up there, and good luck with any more wet weddings you've got coming up. Yeah, thanks. I got a wedding tomorrow. It's supposed to be sunny, which is awesome. So, ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. it yeah, real pleasure, real pleasure, David. And thanks again yeah. for your for your time. No worries. Absolutely, worth your passion.
yeah, it's it's amazing to see. And um, yeah, thanks again. And we'll be back next week with Matt Palmer um, talking about photography projects. So that should be a, a fascinating episode as well. Uh, until then, um, thanks so much for joining us. If you're watching us on YouTube, please give us a like and consider subscribing if, if that's your thing, if you'd like to see more. Um, and we will catch you all next week. Catch you later. All right, keep Bye. well, everyone. <laughs>